This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Juma Bishwas. I am on the mentor of MRCUG Health. Today I am going to discuss a very important topic. This is the nowadays hot topic that is coronavirus infection in pregnancy. And as you can see, that is recently been updated. So if you see the coronavirus in pregnant women, uh, their symptoms more or less are the same uh, that suffering from the general population, but more than two thirds of the identified pregnant women have no symptoms. And most common symptoms of COVID-19 in pregnant women are the same symptoms that are suffering the general population, like cough, fever, sore throat, dyspnea, myalgia, and loss of sense of taste. There's a growing evidence that pregnant women may be at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19 compared with the non-pregnant women, particularly in the second trimester. However, overall risk of death remains very low. And these are the risk factors associated uh, with COVID-19 in pregnancy. Like if the woman is unvaccinated, in case of black, Asian, or minority ethnic background, if the BMI is more than 25 kg per meter square, if women have any kind of comorbidity like diabetes or hypertension, if the woman aged 35 years or older, if they're living um, in a social economic deprivation site, if they're working in healthcare or other public facing occupations. We know that there are three variants recently uh, diagnosed that is alpha variant, delta variant and Omicron variant. Uh, if you see the rate of uh, admission in the hospital with the alpha variant is one is to 10, but in the Delta variant, this is the most severe form of the uh, uh, among the old variants. So the rate of admissions uh, is one is to seven. Omicron variant uh, is less severe if you compare with the Delta variant. Most of the symptoms are like, uh, uh, like the same symptoms of any kind of viral fever but still it's likely to be associated with adverse maternal and neonatal life outcome, especially in the pregnant women who are unvaccinated. Uh, regarding the uh, effect of the COVID-19 uh, in pregnant women is that, like there's no reported increased risk of congenital anomaly uh, and vertical transmission is very, very uncommon. Uh, regarding the risk of stillbirth is approximately double if the woman get infected with COVID-19 and there is an also increased risk of small for gestational age baby. And preterm birth rate risk uh, is increased with the symptomatic COVID-19 that is like two to three times higher than the background rate and they are primarily iatrogenic preterm birth. And because of the pandemic, there's a higher risk of perinatal mental health specifically anxiety and the depression. So what we can see from COVID-19 in the pregnancy uh, is that there's an increased risk of IUGR, stillbirth, uh, stillbirth and also preterm birth, and the woman can suffer from any kind of prenatal mental health disorder. Regarding the vaccination, uh, COVID-19 vaccination is strongly recommended in a pregnant woman. They are the priority group for the vaccination. Uh, However, there are some myths related to COVID-19 vaccination that that can affect the fertility, but there is no evidence that suggests that COVID-19 vaccine affect the fertility. So women who are planning to become pregnant or fertility treatment, they can receive COVID-19 vaccine and they do not need to delay the conception. And it shows that if women receive two doses of vaccination along with the booster, that means total three doses, 88% less likely to be admitted in the hospital with the Omicron variant if you compare with those who are unvaccinated. So that's the reason that is very important to be vaccinated and also have the booster dose. If you compare with the woman who received two doses and the three doses, in that situation, the rate of admission is a bit more with the two doses uh, if you compare with the woman who also received the booster doses. COVID-19 vaccination that can be given at any time in the pregnancy that can include preconception, first trimester, peribirth, and even the postpartum period, even uh, after an uncomplicated assisted birth or cesarean section, patient can receive COVID-19 vaccination. And the more, most preferable choice of the vaccination is the Pfizer-BioTech or 
Moderna vaccine. And breastfeeding women even can receive COVID-19 vaccination without having to stop breastfeeding. These are the benefits of the vaccination. There is a reduction in severe disease and hospital admission for a pregnant woman. There is a potential reduction in the risk of preterm birth associated COVID-19, potential reduction in the transmission of COVID-19 to the vulnerable household member, and also potential reduction in the risk of stillbirth associated with COVID-19, potential protection to the newborn from COVID-19 by passive antibody transfer, and potential reduction in the risk of developing long COVID. So overall, you can see the rate of admission, the risk of preterm birth, risk of transmission of the COVID-19 to the other member, risk of stillbirth is very, very less. And also it can give a passive antibody uh, to the newborn and that can also protect newborn from COVID-19. Regarding the risk of vaccination, there's a minor risk of local reaction. That's the same that if anyone get any vaccination, like pain, redness, or swelling at the injection site, there's a, a mild uh, adverse effects, uh, like patient can experience of fatigue, headache, or myalgia, uh, typically short-lived, like less than a few days. Is a, there's a, evidence shows that there's a very, very rare risk of thrombotic adverse effect if the patient receive Oxford, AstraZeneca, or Janssen uh, vaccines, or very rare cardiac malformation if patients uh, receive Pfizer, Biotech, or Moderna vaccine. So that's the reason in pregnant women, mostly uh, they recommend to get Pfizer vaccines or Moderna vaccine. There has been no evidence to suggest fetal uh, harm following the vaccination against COVID-19 and fetal harm is considered to be extremely unlikely based on the evidence from other non-live vaccine. Risk of fetal harm cannot be precisely estimated until large-scale studies of the vaccination in pregnancy has been complicated, completed. So that's you can see that the risk of vaccination is the same than if anyone received any of the vaccination during pregnancy. And there is also evidence shows that uh, COVID-19, if the women have the COVID-19 infection in the pregnancy, that can passively transfer, tra passively protect the neonates by transfer the antibodies in the neonatal cord blood. And also, even if the woman is breastfeeding, in that case also, that can transfer the antibody to the neonates and that can give a passive immunity. The same thing that if the woman is vaccinated, this vaccine elicited antibody can be also transferred in the neonatal cord blood and also by a breast milk. So that can also give a passive immunity. So that uh, if the woman have the infections or if they receive the uh, antibody, uh, sorry, the vaccination, in that case, that can give passive immunity to the baby. Regarding antenatal care, they should recommend all the scheduled antenatal care um, and healthcare providers should be aware that increased risk of uh, domestic violence in the pregnancy as, uh, during the time of pandemic. So they have to be rule out that things. The women who have been seriously or critically unwell from COVID-19, uh, they should offer an ultrasound scan to assess the fetal biometry. And that should be arranged within first days, first 14 days following the recovery. And they also consider further ultrasound monitoring on the individual basis. As because we know that the risk of IOGR is more. So that's why if the woman have the COVID-19 COVID infection, in that case, they need to assess a fetal biometry, mostly within 14 days. And also they need a further monitoring on an individual basis. VT risk is also there. So all the pregnant women who are admitted uh, with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, they should receive prophylactic low molecular weight heparin unless birth is expected within 12 hours or there is significant risk of hemorrhage. So that means if any woman who have the COVID or suspected COVID admitted in the hospital, they should receive uh, uh, VT prophylaxis. All the women who have been hospitalized and have been confirmed COVID-19 in pregnancy or up to six weeks postpartum, they should be offered thromboprophylaxis at least 10 days following the hospital discharge. So that means when they admitted, you have to start the vaccine uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis 
and that needs to be con com, uh, continued for 10 days following the hospital discharge. A longer duration of the thromboprophylaxis should be considered for the woman with persistent morbidity. So if the woman have additional risk factor, they can continue for longer duration. Otherwise, during the time of admission and they need to continue it for 10 days following hospital discharge. During labor, if the woman with the symptomatic COVID-19, there may be increased risk of fetal compromise in active labor and cesarean birth. So we have to inform to the woman and that's the reason their delivery should be in the consultant led unit and they need a continuous electronic fetal monitoring. If the woman is asymptomatic infection in that case, this is not required. Senior obstetrician and medical input for a woman with severe or critical COVID-19 should be sought and particularly for the decision making about the birth. So that means um, if the woman need any kind of delivery or any management that should be uh, MDT based. Water birth is not contraindicated for the women who are asymptomatic for, of COVID-19. In that case, they should wear a PPE, uh, the person who are providing the care. Women with symptomatic COVID-19 should not labor or birth in water. So that means asymptomatic women, asymptomatic women can uh, uh, deliver in water, but uh, the symptomatic women shouldn't labor or birth in water. If any sign of clinical deterioration, chest X-ray shouldn't be delayed uh, because of risk of radiation exposure. So that means if you suspect about pneumonia or any kind of lung complication, you should arrange a chest X-ray. If you see any signs of decompensation, in that case, you have to escalate it urgently. Like if you see that there's an increasing oxygen requirement or fraction of inspired oxygen above 95%, uh, or the respiratory rate is increased above 25 breaths per minute, or a rapidly rising respiratory rate despite oxygen therapy, a reduction in urine output, acute kidney injury, or any signs of drowsiness. In that case, you need an urgent uh, escalation, escalation. For unwell pregnant women in the third trimester, uh, in that situations, if you think about the delivery, Firstly, you have to think about the maternal stabilization. You have to discuss that matter with the MDT and then you can decide the time of delivery. Aspirin may be beneficial for the adults with severe COVID-19, but you have to uh, potentiate the way of risk versus benefits. And if you think that there's a higher risk of bleeding or any other things in that situation, you have to avoid aspirin. And if you see that there is a thrombocytopenia and platelet is less than 15 to 10 to the power 9 per liter, in that case, you have to stop aspirin. Regarding corticosteroid therapy, that should be given for 10 days or up to discharge, whichever is sooner, for the women who are unwell with COVID-19 and requiring oxygen or ventilatory support. If you see that the steroid is not indicated for fetal lung maturation, in that case, you can give oral prednisolone, 40 milligram once a day, or IV hydrocortisone, 80 milligram twice daily for 10 days or until discharge, whichever is sooner. If steroids are indicated for fetal lung maturity, in that case, give uh, dexamethasone, 12 milligram twice daily, um, uh, 12 milligram twice, that is 24 hours apart, total two doses followed by oral prednisolone, 40 milligram once a day, or IV hydrocortisone, 80 milligram, twice daily to complete total 10 days or until discharge, whichever is sooner. That means if they don't need it for the fetal lung maturation, start the oral prednisolone or IV hydrocortisone. But if the, that is needed for the fetal lung maturity, give dexamethasone, followed by you have to immediately start oral prednisolone or IV hydrocortisone, uh, to complete total 10 days or until discharge, whichever is sooner. Uh, you can also consider monoclonal antibody in pregnant women or the breastfeeding women who are unwell in hospital setting, particularly if they are unvaccinated and or have additional risk factor for severe illness. Remdesivir should only be considered in the pregnant women with COVID-19 who are not improving or who are deteriorating. Hydroxychloroquine 
lopinavir, ritonavir, or azithromycin should not be used because they, they've shown that they are ineffective in the treating COVID-19 infection. Molnapiravir is not also not recommended in the pregnancy because of uh, very limited evidence of safety and the efficacy. So only the thing is that during the um, uh, infections, we can uh, give the aspirin if it is uh, benefit outweigh the risk. We can consider corticosteroids. We can consider monoclonal antibodies if they are severely ill or if there is a risk factor for severe illness. Remdesivir, if, uh, in the pregnant woman, we can also think about that if you see that the symptoms is not improving or they are deteriorating. Regarding the postnatal care, we need to follow the routine postnatal care. And women should be informed that COVID-19 infection is not a contraindication to breastfeeding. That means they can continue breastfeeding. So this is the summary of the acute COVID-19 care. It's very nicely written. How are you going to manage? So you can see that this is a quick reference summary of acute COVID-19 care in pregnancy or up to six weeks postpartum. And we know the most common symptoms are fever, cough, dyspnea, myalgia, and sore throat. And we also know the risk factor for the severe disease. Like if the BMI is high, like more than 25 kg per meter square, if woman age is more than 35 years, any pre-existing comorbidity, black, Asian, or minority ethnicity. So uh, initial assessment and taking contents of the risk factor, uh, you have to see that does the woman fit the following criteria. If you see that the sex is more than or equal to 95% with no desaturation on exertion, if you see the respiratory rate is less than or equal to 20 breaths per minute, heart rate is less than 110, and low clinical concern, in that situation, their care can be um, in the community. That means they don't need any kind of hospital admission. Advice to stay well hydrated and mobile. Give safety net advice like complete BT risk assessment in the line with RCOG Green Top guidelines where normally indicated thromboprophylaxis should be offered. COVID-19 transient risk factor, current systemic infection. Those who are immobile, dehydrated, and score are additional transient risk factor, then you have to point. So that means COVID-19 itself are one risk factor, then you have to calculate whether there's any other risk factor associated with that. If you see that the woman is less than 28 weeks, the score is more than equal to four, more than equal to 10, uh, 28 weeks, if the score is more than equal to three, post, postpartum if the score is more than equal to two, uh, in that situation, they need a prophylaxis. Okay, but uh, if it is low or, low or less in that situation, they don't need any kind of low molecular weight prophylaxis. So always count COVID-19 is one risk factor, as is the other risk factors over there. If you see the score is um, more than equal to four in less than 28 weeks, or more than equal to 28 weeks, more than or equal to three. In postpartum period, if you see that is more than equal to two, in that case, they need a prophylaxis. But if any point, if you see that they are critically ill or any kind of high clinical concern, in that situation, they need admission with appropriate isolation. Then you have to do some investigations like uh, FBC, UNEs, LFT, LDH, coagulation, ferritin, troponin, and ABG. Uh, you have to do some other specific investigations like anti-spike antibody against such COVID-19 too if required for neutralizing the monoclonal antibody decision, consider ECG, ECO, CT, CTPA, influenza testing. And then you have to consider the sepsis. In that situation, if you see that SAS is more than 94%, monitoring the respiratory rates and SATs hourly, uh, IV excess, blood culture, IV antibiotics, if additional in any infection like bacterial infection, and you have to cautiously give IV fluids like 200 to 500 ml if lactate is more than 2 millimole per liter and reassess. Fluid balance monitoring. Okay, so you have to maintain the SARS, give an IV excess, blood culture, give IV antibiotic you associated with any bacterial infection, give IV fluid with cautious if the lactate is more than 2 and maintain an intake output chart. In case of severity of the disease, if it is a mild disease, Patient not requiring oxygen, 
no evidence of COVID-19 pneumonia or other sepsis. In that situation, they need a prophylaxis during admission and 10 days post-discharge. Okay, so that means in my disease, in that situation, you have to give um, um, uh, prophylaxis, BT prophylaxis. In case of moderate disease or severe disease, moderate means that if they have COVID-19 pneumonia or other sepsis requiring oxygen, uh, in that case, or uh, in severe forms like patients with COVID-19 pneumonia and or other sepsis requiring mechanical ventilation or CPAP. That means either of these things they need in that situations before prescribing low molecular weight heparin, that should be discussed with the MDT, including a senior obstetrician, obstetric medicines or hematology team. Uh, then you have to follow this clinical management. Okay, so in case of mild form, uh, in that situation, you can prescribe low molecular weight heparin, but if they have any COVID pneumonia or any other sepsis requiring oxygen, or if they are in CPAP or in the ventilation, in that case, before prescribing the COVID uh, 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 BT prophylaxis, you have to uh, discuss with them. Regarding the clinical, uh, 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 regarding the clinical management, all the women should receive the NDT input, including the decisions of around the early delivery, plus minus magnesium sulfate if required, from escalation of care if uh, is imperative in the deterioration patient. We already know about the signs of deterioration. Use supplementary oxygen if you see the SATS is, uh, is uh, less than 94%. To maintain that, then you have to use oxygen. Uh, consider proning up uh, at least 28 weeks of pregnancy uh, uh, as because to prevent any kind of hypotension. Consider continuing any previously prescribed prophylactic aspirin in for preeclampsia prophylaxis unless the platelet is less than 15 to 10 to the power 9. So that means uh, if it is uh, if they are taking the aspirin for prevention of preeclampsia, they can continue unless they have any signs of thrombocytopenia. Aim to neutral fluid balance. And regarding the steroid, we already know about that. You can give oral prednisolone 40 milligram once daily or IV hydrocortisone 80 milligram twice daily. Uh, but if the patient needs to be um, delivered and they need a steroid for the lung maturation, so give the IV dexamethasone and then you, they can continue prednisolone. And then use uh, toclizumab or sarilumab uh, in women with hypoxia, or if you see the CRP is more than 75, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies should be considered in the women who are hospitalized with symptomatic infection and who do not have such antibodies in that situations or who are in the um, in the community and who have very high risk factors. Okay, so that means if they do not have the antibodies, in that case, you can consider neutralizing monoclonal antibody. Remdesiv should only be considered if they are not improving or if they are deteriorating. Ivermectin should only be considered within the contents of clinical trial. Mon, uh, molnupiravir is not recommended in the pregnancy until further studies has established. Azathiomycin, hydrocortisone, uh, if, uh, iopinavir or ritonavir has been, uh, has been, should be ineffective and should not be used. So that means uh, in that situation, firstly that we have to manage by MDT. And if there's any features of deteriorating symptoms, then in that case, we have to uh, escalate that matter. And if the patient's uh, SATS is very low to maintain saturation more than 94%, we can provide oxygen. We can keep the patients on prone position uh, if the pregnancy is more than 28 weeks to prevent any hypotension. If the patient is already taking aspirin, they can continue this aspirin unless their uh, the platelet level is very low. If the patient is requiring oxygen in that situations uh, and uh, 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 in that situations, if we need to give a steroids, uh, we have to think about that. If you see that the patient doesn't uh, need any early delivery, then only we can give oral prednisolone or IV hydrocortisone. But if that is for the lung maturation, then you have to give the IV dexamethasone and then you can uh, switch over it to oral prednisolone. And then um, tokilizumab or sarilumab, that is for the patients who are having the hypoxia uh, or and poor CRP is more than 75. 
neutralizing monoclonal antibody you can give if you see that patient doesn't have any antibodies rem desivir you can only prescribe if you see that patient is not improving or they are deteriorating the most things for you to remember is that if any patient is need to be admission in that situations you have to give uh, bta prophylaxis so that's the very very important things you need to remember so that's all about covid 19 in pregnancy so these are the important highlighted point you need to remember in covid 19 in pregnancy um, and if you have any questions related to that i'm happy to answer you can ask on the comment box and i will be happy to answer all of your questions thank you for listening